Doug, if you'd come, and I'm going to have Doug um, introduce our speaker. Uh, Doug is um, uh, one of our elders. He has done an incredible job with our GO team, has a great heart for missions and sending people all over the world, and uh, it's been a real joy. And you are about to hear a message that is transforming, and it's God-directed. Amen. Well, uh, first, of all, I just want to praise the Lord, the living God, for he's doing something in our midst and changing our hearts and minds, and we're coming to a new level of maturity that is just thrilling inside, that we are looking outward more. And uh, with pastors in Bangladesh, he's in uh, Afghanistan, and our speaker this morning, I'm thrilled, I'm thrilled. So this morning we have a special, and this afternoon we have a special message from Bob Shogren. Bob Shogren is the president of Unveiling Glory, which is really devoted to awakening the church to a new awareness of God's glory. Um, they've been, this Unveiling Glory message has been presented in 30 nations around the world and has personally impacted me and several others here at Home Church. I heard it here several years ago. Um, uh, before that, uh, Bob co-founded Frontiers Missions, which is right on the front lines of bringing Christ to the Muslim peoples of the world. He has uh, written several books. They're out on the table in the lobby. And he has four children and a wife who he lives with in Richmond, Virginia. Now, this afternoon, uh, right after service, we're going to have a quick ha break for lunch, a very quick break. And then we're going to be back here at 1.30 this afternoon. Bob is going to bring another couple messages from 1.30 to 3.30 this afternoon. Now, we tr really try to honor your time on Sunday afternoons, and we do that, but this is a special message and that the body of Christ needs to hear. And as an overseer in this church, I implore you to come. Make room in your schedule. We're going to have lunch here if you need to grab it. You can just do that. Be, be back here at 1.30 to hear the message uh, this afternoon. It's a message that's needed. Now, with that, if you would give a warm welcome for Bob Shogun. Well, good morning. I'm Bob, B-O-B, B-O-B, forwards, backwards, can't screw it up. I'm a very simple person with a very simple name, uh, but a passion that is inside me that I cannot, cannot stop, a passion for the glory of our Father. Before I get into that, let me introduce you to my family. I am married to a beautiful Southern Belle. You can see her on the left. Her name is Debbie. We've been married for 24 years. And uh, we've got four children, two boys and two girls. They go chronologically from left to right. Our oldest is Luke. Luke is 21 years of age. He is a senior at James Madison University, the state school in Virginia. And uh, he graduates this spring and feels called to go to Somalia uh, in, in Africa. So he'll be working over there. Next is our daughter, Elise. We homeschool all of our four kids. Elise graduated a year early, so she had a free year. So she spent time in Amman, Jordan. She went to Amman, Jordan as a nanny for a missionary family, and uh, that caught her heart. And so she, learned, she began to learn Arabic, still learning Arabic, and uh, she'll probably end up in the Middle East. Next is our daughter, Abigail. Abigail is uh, 18 years of age. She's a freshman uh, at uh, James Madison University. Elise is a junior at another university, Christopher Newport. But Abby's a freshman where her brother goes, and uh, like her sister, she graduated early and spent time in Mozambique uh, working at an orphanage fell in love and left her heart with about 44 uh, orphans uh, at a small orphanage in Mozambique. Next is the big boy, Hunter. Hunter is uh, going to be 16 this Wednesday, and he loves basketball, Jesus, and video games, hopefully not in that order, and uh, is an absolutely great kid. We love to have him. But uh, I'm here uh, to help you understand something that we don't like to talk about. And it's something about the church, and, and it deals with what I call conflicting and confusing communication. Conflicting and confusing communication in the church. So in order to help me out, where are my high schoolers? Let me see my high school hands. Okay, all of you guys up front right now. Right now, come on. Get up. Up front. Get up. Come on. We're waiting on you. Erica. And Eva, I need four volunteers with you. I need 10 people up front. So Erica and Eva, you guys have to pick them out. Come on. Come on, guys. Let's go. The whole church is waiting on you. Okay. Women, you get the chairs. Men, you're on the floor, except for the 10 that they, Erica and Eva, get. Now, Erica and Eva, you know, Dad, I hate it when missionaries stay at our house. Never again. 
Uh, but come on, guys. Give me 10 people and get up here in front. Let's go. Get 10. Eric and Eva. 10 people and bring them up front. Just, just That's right. Just pick them out. Let's go. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Because this talk deals directly with you high school students. Come on, 10 people. Okay, just 10 high schoolers. Let's go. Okay, you guys can count, right? Can you guys count how many are up there? Thank you. Here you go. Come on. Stand up here, right here. Right here. Stand up here so everybody can see you. Come on. I'm, they're applauding you that you can count. Now, is that embarrassing or what? That is embarrassing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Two of you stand off here to the side. Right there. That's fine. Right there. Okay. There's eight of you, right? Okay. Guess what? Statistics say that after you graduate from high school, you eight will no longer follow Christ. Nope. 80% of you are going to be called what's called the de-churched. The de-churched are those who say, I'm tired of the hypocrisy. I'm tired of the rules. I'm tired. I'm going my own way. 80% of you, once you leave high school. Why? Because there's conflicting and confusing communication in the church. Okay? Four of you, take a knee. You four, take a knee. We are really hurting, aren't we? What's your name? No, forget it. One of you, take a knee. One of you, doesn't matter. Okay? You will be divorced after you marry. You will be divorced after you marry. And guess what? You're the one who stayed in the church. The non-Christian world has a 50% divorce rate. The Christian world has a 50% divorce rate. Why? There's confusing, conflicting communication going on in the church. All of you and all of you are going to tithe. You're going to give money to the poor, to the help, to the needy, you guys to the church. You are going to give... 2.6% of your dollars that you earn. 2.6. You are going to give 2.7%. You guys, non-Christians, give more money than Christians. It's embarrassing, isn't it? I'm going to tell you why. There's conflicting, confusing communication in the church. Go down and have a seat. Let me help you to understand this conflicting and confusing communication going on in the church. And if you guys learn the difference in the communication, it's going to save your marriages. Oh, don't worry. When we get married, we'll be in love. Throw up. Everybody's in love when they get married. Huh? As a non-Christian, pal. As a non-Christian. You weren't over on this other side. Okay? I was at a church, and I was asked to speak in a Sunday school, and so I was very unprepared. So I said, Lord, you know, the one-second prayer, what do you want me to say? So I got in there, and I, I discovered something very interesting. I asked him, I said, what is the purpose for the church? The purpose for the church. And so I asked him to ask to give me answers. And then, what do you think they said? Yell out some things. Fellowship. Fellowship. What else? Train, Train others. What else? Worship. Worship. What else? Spread the word. Spread the word. What else? Relation. We already said relationships, okay? Glorify God. Glorify God. Okay, good. So they, they listed a bunch of things right here. I said, okay, what is the purpose for Christ's death? Salvation, to save us from our sins. What else? I'm sorry? Redemption, yeah. So they listed a bunch of things. I said, okay, now, now, I, now I need your help. I said... So I said, everybody here in this Sunday school class has one vote. And I want you to tell me what is the primary purpose. Primary. So I asked them, what was the primary purpose for the church? And they all voted. One came out on top. Anybody want to guess what it is? No. To glorify God. That's what they voted. They said, this is the purpose for the church. The purpose of the church exists to glorify God. I said, wonderful. Wonderful. I said, what is the primary purpose for Christ's death? And they all voted. Guess which one came out on top? Salvation. To die for us and our sins. I said, okay, good. I said, now let me ask you another question. I said, what does the one on the left non-verbally communicate? 
What's life all about? And what do you think they said? Life is all about God. Life is all about God. I said, great. I said, what does the one on the right communicate? Life is all about us. Bingo. Life is all about us. I said, welcome to the conflicting, confusing communication found in the church. Is life about us or is life about God? Well, for Christ died for us. So which is it? Until we understand the primary purpose of Christ's death on the cross, we will have a 50% divorce rate in the church. We'll have 80% of our youth leave God when they go to college. We will only give what non-Christians give. And you'll never be able to tell the difference between a Christian versus a non-Christian, except maybe for the language they use. I said, that's it. That's it. Men and women, there are two sides to the cross. The one side of the cross says that Christ died for us. We're all very familiar with that side. But there's another side of the cross, and I want to explain to you that other side of the cross. If you turn with me in your Bibles, glad you high schoolers all brought your Bibles, to 2 Samuel chapter 11, you find something very interesting. 2 Samuel chapter 11, you all know the story. The story is David and Bathsheba. David is surfing the Internet He's supposed to be off at work, but he's not. He's surfing the Internet. As he's surfing the Internet, he comes upon some pornography. He sees Bathsheba, and he finds out about her, inquires about her, and then he ends up sleeping with her. As he sleeps with her, she then goes back home, realizes she's pregnant, so David brings back her husband, Uriah. Uriah is one of David's trusted fighting men. David has 30 trusted fighting men. Uriah is one of those trusted fighting men. So he brings Uriah back, throws a party for him, says, hey, go home, sleep with your wife. He goes home. He says, I won't sleep with my wife because the men are still fighting. And so he throws a second party for him, gets him stone drunk, wants him to sleep with his wife so David can get rid of his embarrassment. Doesn't sleep with his wife, sleeps outside the gates because of his fighting men. He goes back to war. David sends a letter with him that says, put him in the front of the line, sends it to Joab, the head of the army. Joab, the head of the army, gets his orders, kill Uriah. Put him in the front of the lines. Everybody withdraw, have, have Uriah killed. So David basically murders the man in order to get rid of his guilt. Says, oh, honey, your husband died. Come and be my wife. Let's have a baby together. And the story is found in 2 Samuel 11. Now, I want you to see something in verse 3. David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam? E-L-I-A-M. Eliam, if you cross-reference that in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 34, is also one of David's trusted fighting men. So I want you to get a perspective. David, who should have been fighting a war, is surfing the Internet, calls on some pornography, basically, sees a woman, brings her in and sleeps with her. He sleeps with his fighting... He's got 30 trusted fighting men who are putting their life on the line for him, and he sleeps with one of their daughters... And one of their wives, same woman, Bathsheba. Got the story, yes or no? Okay. Now, somewhere in the midst of these pages is a story. It's not written. It's not in the Bible. It deals with Uriah's parents who are Hittites. Hittites, they're not Israelites. They're Hittites, Uriah the Hittite. And that story goes something like this. The wife walked in from the market. Husband, there's a rumor going around town. The husband looks up from the table where he was eating. So there's always rumors going around town. What are you talking about? No, you need to know this rumor. What's the rumor? The king has slept with our daughter-in-law. Woman, are you crazy? What are you talking about? It's all over town, husband. How do they know? Well, some of them saw one of the king's servants leave the palace and go to Bathsheba's house. And 30 minutes later, Bathsheba came out dressed up with perfume and she stayed there all night. How do you know he slept with her? Husband, what else do men do with beautiful women all night? Of course he slept with her. I don't believe this. Husband, it's all over town. I expected this from the God of the Hittites and from the king of the Hittites because they have no morals, they have no values, but the God of the Israelites, the king of the Israelites, this doesn't make sense. Eight weeks go by, wailing from the wife. My son... My son, he's dead. He's dead. The husband tries to comfort her when all of a sudden 
there is a silent knock at the door. The husband goes and opens the door. Joab, Eliam, two of David's trusted fighting men, you've come to console us from the loss of our son, Uriah. Oh, thank you for coming. They walk in the door quietly and sheepishly. Thank you for coming. Why are you here? He looks to Eliam. Eliam looks down at his feet, doesn't answer. He looks to Joab. Joab is speechless. Why are you here? Please tell us that our son died valiantly. Yes, your, your son died uh, valiantly. Um, we're here to ask you a question. Yes, yes, what is it? Your son, he was here a couple of weeks ago and, and uh, was with the king. Yes, yes, the king threw a party for him and, and uh, honored him greatly. Our, our, our son loved the king. He honored the king. He served the king with all of his heart. Yes, it was a great party, we heard. Uh, did, did anything happen between the king and your son? Not, not that we know of. Everything was fine. In fact, he asked them back a second night and threw a bigger party for him, and he got drunk. But you know what? He loved you men on the front line, and he never went into his house and slept with his wife because he wanted to honor you. He honored the king. He honored you. You know our son was a man of character. You know our son was, was a tremendous man of God. Yes, we know that, they said, quietly. Um, did you, did, did, uh, the king gave him an oath. Oh, yes, we saw the king give him an oath. It was sealed with a king's signature. Did you read that note? Of course we didn't read the note. It's a signature of the king. You never break a signature of the king. Did Uriah? No, Uriah never read it. He, would never, he, he gave it to you, didn't he? Yes, he did. I, I, I didn't think they read it. Why? What, what are you talking about? Our son is dead. Why are you talking about a note? Well, the, the note said that I was to put Uriah at the front of the line and then withdraw and have him killed. What? The king wanted our son killed? Yes, that's right. Why would he want that? We don't know. That's that's why we've come. We we want to find out if anything happened between the king and, and Uriah. No, everything was fine. There was a long pause in the room, and during that pause, the wife quit her sobbing and broke the pause. I know why he killed him. What, woman? What are you talking about? How could you know it's in the heart of a king? What are you What are you talking about? I know why he killed Uriah. Why? Tell us why. Bathsheba is pregnant. What? Our daughter-in-law is pregnant? Eliam said, my daughter is pregnant? She can't be pregnant. He's been out fighting a war. And when he was here, he never slept with her. He cannot be pregnant. What are you talking about? The mother responded, the seed that is within her is not that of Uriah, it's of King David. What? David slept with my daughter and got her pregnant? I'm out there fighting wars on his behalf. I'm putting my life on the line when he should be fighting with me and he's out sleeping with my daughter? A sword was drawn. Uriah's father went to the door. Joab saw it, rushed to the door, put his hands behind the door and said, Father of Uriah, what are you doing? I'm going to go kill the king. You'll never get close to him. Get out of my way, Joab. You'll never get close. He murdered my son. Does your God not say an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? Yes. Then let me have vengeance. Let me take on this king because he murdered my son. I demand his life. I get that by your God's own law. You'll never do it. The guards will strike you down. You won't get close. A second sword came out of its sheath. And Joab walked, or Eliam walked to Joab. Put the sword to his neck. I shall kill him. The guards will let me, and I'm one of his trusted fighting men. Joab had two swords at his throat, one dull, one very sharp. One could kill him in a single blow. He took a large gulp and prayed silently to God. And then spoke. 
Elium. You remember God's law. You know what it is. God says, vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. Let God take David's life. You cannot take it. And do you remember Achan in the book of Joshua? Achan broke one of the commandments he stole. And what happened to him? He, his wife, his children, his sheep, all were killed by God. David has broken three commandments. He coveted his neighbor's stuff. He committed adultery and he murdered. Three of the Ten Commandments, let God take David's life. He is a faithful God. He is a just God. He will do what is right. Eliam stood there thinking. He put his sword down and he said to the father of Uriah, he is right. Our God has never let us down. Our God is holy. Our God is just. He will take David's life. Uriah's father fell to his knees crying, not knowing what to do. Two weeks go by. The wife walks in. Husband, the prophet has spoken and confronted David. Finally, justice will be done. My son's life will be vindicated. David is going to die. What did he say? The prophet said to David that trouble is going to follow your house all the days of your life. But what about his life? When is he going to die? The prophet said, The Lord has put away your sins. You shall not die. What? David's not going to die? But what about his own law? What about an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? Is this God not just anymore? Does he let those in high leadership get away with sin? Is he not holy? Is he not righteous? Are you feeling the tension, yes or no? Amen. So what are his parents thinking? What are his parents feeling? Huh? That he's unjust. That he's not a righteous God. That he's not a holy God. Turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, we read these words about the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. It says these words. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, what can never? All the sacrifices of the Old Testament, the lambs, the goats, all these things. For for this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could they would have stopped being offered. For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are annual reminders of their sins. Okay, here's the key, verse 4. Because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So in the Old Testament... They had to go once a year, offer sacrifices for their sin. What Hebrews is saying is their sin was never dealt with. Their sin was never punished. That's what it's saying. So the sin of multiple people in the Old Testament was never dealt with. And because of it, God had a PR problem. God had a public relations problem. People did not think he was holy. People did not think he was just. People did not think he was righteous. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3, verse 25, and find out why Paul says Christ came to die. Romans chapter 3, Romans 3, 25 and 26. Paul, in speaking about Christ's death, says these words. Now I'm reading from the NIV. If you've got the NIV, read with me and yell out when I do not speak. So you can fill in the blank. God, God being the holy God, presented him, Christ, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this. Why? He did this to demonstrate his what? His justice. God did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance or in his patience, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Feel it? Unpunished. God did not punish David the way he should have been punished. 
He left the sins unpunished. He did this to demonstrate his justice at the present time. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. In other words, Paul says, when Christ came, God sent Christ to vindicate his name, to make his name holy, to make his name righteous, to say that he is a just God. He is a righteous God. All those sins in the Old Testament were not just left go of and not dealt with. He did deal with them, but he dealt with them on the cross with his son. He never really dealt with them in the Old Testament because the blood of bulls and goats doesn't take away sin. So Paul says that Christ came to vindicate his name. Well, what about Christ? Why did Christ think he came? In John chapter 12, verses 27 and 28, Christ is walking to Jerusalem. He's going to the cross. And as he's going to the cross, he's talking to his disciples. He knows he's going to die the worst death any human can die. Now, how, does Christ, how did Christ die? How does anybody die on the cross? Okay. You all know how it happens. One nail in one hand, one nail in the other, one nail through the two feet. But he doesn't die because of the nails. He's hanging on the cross in agony with pain in his hands. He's run out of oxygen. He has to push up to get some oxygen. So he pushes up in pain, (gasps) breathes in a breath, collapses to pain. All that oxygen gets used up, exhales, pushes in pain, (gasps) breathes in oxygen, goes back to pain. And he keeps doing this until he is so exhausted, he what? He suffocates. That is how you die on a cross. It's suffocation. I can't breathe, man. I have no energy. And you die. It's the worst death any human can endure. Christ knew he's going to this death. Okay. You high schoolers, here's the question. See, I saw you talking to him. Here's the question, high schoolers. When Christ went to the cross and talked to his father, see, he says to his disciples, now my heart is troubled, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was this very reason I came into this hour. He's talking to his disciples, but then he says, Father. So he starts to talk to his heavenly father about why he's going to the cross. Now, here's the question. Here it is. When Christ talked to his heavenly father about going to the cross, do you think he talked to his heavenly father about the primary reason as to why he went to the cross or the secondary reason he went to the cross? What do you think? Primary. Do you all agree? Primary? Okay. He's got two options. And the one option, he could say, Father, glorify your name. Or the other option, he could say, Father, save these kind, wonderful, worthy people from hell. They don't deserve it. Right? Two options. Go to your Bibles and tell me what he said. John chapter 12, verse 28. You tell me what Christ said to his father in thinking about going to the cross. Go on, open your Bibles. Okay, you can't yell it out. I got to take a drink of water, all right? Go to your Bibles, look at it. Father, what's he say? Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. The true driving passion that put Jesus Christ on the cross was to bring his father glory. glory. But we get conflicting, confusing communication in the church. Why? Like a rose trampled on the ground, you took the fall and thought of me. Above all, theologically, it's an incorrect song. Theologically, it's an incorrect song. He did not think of us above all on the cross. He thought of his father's glory. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we realize it's not about us. Christ died primarily to glorify God. And we have a consistent Christianity, finally, once and for all. The purpose of the church is to glorify God. The purpose of Christ's death is to glorify God. And I'll bet the purpose of you guys going to school is to... No, no, let them say it. I'll bet the reason you guys go to school is to... For what? Oh, yeah, but what do most students go to school for? Education. Why? 
To be smart. Why? Why do you want to be smart? Get a good job. Why? Right. So that you can have a island. Exactly. A nice, safe, comfortable life. Right? Right? And what you've just communicated is that life is all about us. The reason I go to school is to get a job, to get a nice career, and have a nice, safe, comfortable life. And you've missed it. You've missed it. That's why 80% of you are going to fall away as soon as you get out of here. That's why half of you are going to divorce. I'll never divorce. Oh, grow up. Come on. Unless you live with a driving passion to glorify God. Odds are 50% you're going to divorce. And all of a sudden, you realize life is about glorifying God. And you find a consistent theme in the word of God. No matter what page you turn to, no matter what section you go to, you find a theme, you find a ribbon, you find a, a thread of communication in page after page of the Bible about glorifying God. And all of a sudden, life begins to make sense. Chapter 1 in the creation is God putting His glory on display in the heavens. The begat section is all about God's glory, taking one cell from a male, one cell from a female, and creating a new human being. It's the glory of God. Joseph is about the glory of God. Abraham is about the glory of God. The promised land is about the glory of God. Uh, the dispersion is about the glory of God. Where Jesus located his ministry is about the glory of God. Paul's suffering is about the glory of God. The revelation is about the glory of God. And all of a sudden you realize life is about glorifying God. It's no longer about me. If the purpose of the church is to glorify God, if the purpose of Christ's death is to glorify God, I'll bet the purpose of your marriages is to. I bet the reason you go to work is to. I'll bet the reason the way you drive should be to. I'll bet the way you raise your children should be to. I bet the way you obey your parents should be to. The way you treat your teachers should be to. And the way you play basketball should be to. No, I play basketball to win. I missed it. I missed it. I invest in the stock market for my retirement. I missed it. But God wants me to have a good retirement. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Did you ever study the book of Job? Well, he had a good retirement. What are you talking about? Oh, no, not Job. You see, when we focus on us, we always relate to the winner, the victor, the champion in the scriptures. When you live for the glory of God, you study everybody in the book of Job, and you say, why don't I ever relate to Job's kids? What? Job's kids? They all died. Why would I relate to them? Why not? Why do we always have to relate to the one who comes out winning in the end? Can you imagine the conversation Job's kids had with God? They had a godly father, right? Yes or no? You think they made it to heaven? Yes or no? I think so. I think we're going to meet him in heaven. And I think when they got to heaven, all ten of them at once, they said, <laughs> Lord, uh, could we have a little conversation with you? Oh, yes, I'd love to. Yeah, uh, you took us all at once. Why was that? Oh, I loved you all so much, I allowed you to come home early. <laughs> yeah, God, uh, uh, just why exactly did you do that? Oh, I wanted to give your father an opportunity to glorify me by teaching him a lesson. What? You teach our father a lesson, so you take us home early? Yes, that's right. But God, I, I was going to inherit the business, would say the oldest son. And the next would say, Lord, I was hoping to go into the ministry. And the next would have said, Lord, we were recently married, and, and we just wanted to have kids. And the last man said, Lord, I was just hoping to get married. To which I believe the Lord would say, oh, I'm sorry, it wasn't about you. It never was. Lord, that just doesn't seem fair. Oh, the way I run my creation is not based on fairness. The way I run my creation is based on revealing my glory. And what I did through each of you, my glory shone brightly. But here I have something for each of you, this, and he rewards them. What? We get all this? Oh, yes, you played your role in revealing my glory so well. Some I blessed with things, 
Some I allow to be persecuted. Some I bring home early. It's all part of a beautifully stained glass window which reveals my glory. Men and women, life is not about you. But I'm not happy in my marriage. So? Who said it was about you being happy? It's about you glorifying God in your marriage. So you start doing things that will make God look good. But I don't want to obey my parents. So? Who said it's about you feeling good? You obey your parents to glorify God. That's not going to make me feel good. Well, guess what? The cross didn't make Jesus feel good either. And Jesus was on the cross primarily to... And if Jesus endured suffering for the glory of God, I think you guys can do a little suffering to obey your parents. And you parents can do a little suffering to make your children grow in the glory of God. Life is not about us. But because we tend to think it's about us, we can sing songs totally differently. Can we have those last verses, please? We sang it. We're going to get the verses up. There we go. You can see him back there. I can see him. I don't know if you can see him, but. You are my shield, my strength, my portion, deliverer, my shelter, stronghold tower, my very present help in time of need. Now, there's two ways you can sing that song. What's the one way you can sing it? Oh, God, I'm in need. Get me out of this crisis. My 401k is a 201k. God, I, I'm having a hard time making payments on the house. God, I lost my job. Oh, God, I'm in need. Help me, period. Help me. That's if we think life is all about us. What's another way we can sing the song? God, I'm in time of need. Give me strength to glorify you with a good attitude while I am wondering what's going to happen to my retirement. While I'm wondering what's going to happen to my house loan. Maybe I'm supposed to lose the house and go to Afghanistan and to share my faith over there. Maybe that's what God wants. Lord, help me in this time of need to glorify you. Two different ways you can sing the song. Two different Christianities. Two totally different Christianities. One Christianity says it's all about glorifying God. One Christianity says it's all about us. And when you think it's all about us and you get that confusing, conflicting communication in the church. You go to church. You do all the rules. You keep them for one primary purpose. I want to be blessed by God. That's the only reason you obey the rules. You want to be blessed by God. This is the best book I've read in the past 15 years. I brought a couple copies. If you want it, it's called The Prodigal God. In this book, he says there's two types of sin that Jesus talked about in the story of the prodigal son. It's really the prodigal sons. Both sons were prodigal. Everything the younger brother did by leaving and going out and doing the things of the world the older son did by staying in the father's house. He did the exact same thing. Neither wanted a relationship with the father. So what Jesus was saying is there's two types of sin. There are those who go outside of the church and break all the rules because they don't want a relationship with God. And there are those who stay inside the church and... No. Mm -mm. There are those who stay inside the church and... Keep all the rules... And they don't want a relationship with God either. They just want his blessings. You realize there are people here in this room who are keeping all the rules for one primary purpose. Not to glorify God. So that they can be blessed. I don't want to be divorced. I don't want my kids growing up all screwed up. I don't want to have all these problems. I want to have a nice home, nice retirement. God bless me. I'm here in church every day. Bless me. And it was never about a relationship with God and glorifying him. Lord, if you want my life in Afghanistan like that, dear sister, and do that, fine. Your Lord, your Lord. Excellent book. 
prodigal God. Well, there are two sides to the cross, men and women. Two sides to the cross. This side you're all very familiar with because you see it week after week, and that is Christ died for us. It's true, it's real, it's not incorrect, but it is incomplete. There's another side of the cross that you see, it's here because I know your pastor and he's been preaching on it consistently, a consistent theme, but many times we miss it. And that is that Christ died primarily to bring his father glory. Here is the greatest question facing the church today. Which side is primary? Which side is primary? Did Christ die primarily for us or did he die primarily for the glory of the father? To answer that question, you found in this book, the other side of the cross. The other side of the cross. In this, I go into great depth about what happens when you have these two Christianities. When it's about us, what happens and what takes place. I encourage you, think about this book. At 1.30, we'll be going over this book, Cat and Dog Theology. Cat and Dog Theology can change your life, as can the other side of the cross. They're both parallel, but they say different things. Cat and dog theology is based on a very simple joke about the differences between a cat and a dog. A dog says, you pet me, you feed me, you love me, you shelter me. Ah, you must be God. Cat says the exact same thing. You pet me, you feed me, you love me, you shelter me. Ah, I must be God. (laughs) That joke characterizes how many Christians today feel. It's not they live for God. It's God lives for them. It's not... God bless America, it's America bless God. Two different Christianities. Two different Christianities. We'll be talking about that at 1.30. The next hour, we'll be going over this, unveiled at last. If we want to bring God glory, do we want to bring him some glory, a lot of glory, or maximum glory? What do you think? Maximum glory. How do we do that as a humanity? It's found in this book, and it's found in the second lecture that we're at today. Let me go over two more things and then I'm done. I firmly believe most Christians have given up on prayer. Why? The average Christian today prays a walloping three minutes a day. The average pastor prays five minutes a day. Why? I want to challenge you early on in our Christianity. I believe many Christians prayed selfish prayers. James 4, 2, God says, I don't answer selfish prayers. They prayed those selfish prayers early in their Christian life. They didn't see God answer and they said, prayer doesn't work. So they check in for three minutes. God, I'm here. Please bless me. Amen. <laughs> this DVD series, it's eight 20 minute lessons, helps you to pray what I call God centered prayers. Gentlemen, ladies, there's a whole website. Go to prayer 2 You can download God-centered prayers to your iPod and just put it on and listen to God-centered prayers. Prayers like, Father, I've always told you I want to glorify you in my life, but now in my same death, glorify your name in my death. If you want me to die at the age of 19, fine. You want me to do a long, strewn-out death through cancer, that's fine. You want a quick death, that's fine too. What matters is not how I die, but that my death bring you. Now, how many of you prayed a prayer like that? One. Hardly, hardly anybody, two. Why? We don't pray those kind of prayers. Why? Because it's about us. We've had mixed up, confusing communication in the church. Lastly, Unhidden. This book is a deep, heavy, thick book. It's a blow-away book, but it's very difficult to read. This author had to make up words because the English language can't handle it. In it, he talks about the essence of God. Who is God? Very quickly, anybody heard of the seven spirits of God in the book of Revelation? He goes and helps us understand it. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, intellect, emotions, will, length, width, breadth, and depth. Time, I'm sorry, height, width, breadth, and time. The seven spirits of God. He blows away the Big Bang Theory and helps you to understand how God did it, and he helps you in understanding the flood. Why did the flood happen? Well, resources out there, if you want them, they're there. I encourage you, please, please, come back today, 1.30. It's, that's in 45 minutes. We've got lunches out there, s- servings for 175 people, so we've got plenty of food for you. Grab a bite, come back in here, be here at one thirty, and discover the other side of the cross and how it changes your life in a practical, real day-to-day basis. Back to you.